On today's podcast, we sat down with music agent Pete Anderson. Very, very interesting conversation. Pete has really developed a very, very strong reputation for the alternative and counterculture music scene. We talked a lot about how people are building careers with acts that you may never have never heard of. We've talked about how the role of social media is really helping people to have a career that might not necessarily been able to have one in the past. How various countercultures and lifestyles are finding audiences and successfully building music careers for themselves, the most effective way for new acts to build fan bases, and much, much more. You really are not going to want to miss this if you're a band who's starting out. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, Insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sat down and spoke with music agent Pete Anderson about the changing nature of the live music landscape, how artists and bands from the counterculture and various lifestyles are finding audiences and successfully building solid careers for themselves, the most effective ways for new acts to build fan bases, and much, much more. You won't want to miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label a r music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, Insiders. Today's featured interview is with Agent Pete Anderson. What is an agent and how does it differ from a manager? An agent is somebody who gets you work. A manager is somebody who handles your entire career. So it's important to understand that distinction. We talked with the agent, Pete Anderson, and we looked at a lot of very interesting things. We looked at, you know, where do you need to be at in your career to attract an agent? Some of the most effective ways to build a fan base if you're if you're an artist starting out. We looked at, you know, how do you promote yourself in cities that you've never played. And we looked at, you know, the, the international market and, and his ideas around very interesting concepts around niche audiences. He had a lot to say about niche audiences and lifestyle marketing and getting into those, you know, niches in terms of building something with things that are out of the ordinary that you just normally wouldn't think of. So it was a very, very interesting interview in that and very, very timely with regards to the world that we're living in today, which is, you know, more and more and more niche oriented. I I think, you know, who was it that said that? I think it's Bob Lefset that said, you know, we live in a world of musical niches. That is what the world is today. It's all about the the individual niche. Yeah. Some of the other points that I took from this uh, interview that I thought were great was, you know, at, you know, we spoke about at what point should an artist be at before considering a tour. Uh, and in terms of filled, uh, building fan bases today, who's doing it right? Mm. And another very interesting point that I thought that we've talked about you and I, uh, you know, privately in our conversations, but about legacy acts and the bottom coming from under and what it means for the future of new acts about building those legacy acts of the future. I thought that was a very interesting take on what he had about, you know, speaking about that. Yes. And it, it, it is interesting because that, that, that topic, Eric, and that that whole subject matter is something that has, you know, I've heard Michael Rapino speak about that, who's the chairman of Live Nation. It's something that has been coming. It's like a slow train coming that's been coming for about 10 years. Right. And it's really here. And we're starting, you know, sadly, and in the most profound senses of loss, we're starting to see that whole, you know, whether it was Malcolm from ACDC, whether it was Lemmy, whether it was David Bowie, whether it was Prince or, you know, and we in the next 10 years will continue to see 
that world and the people that have occupied it for literally the last half century, 40, 50 years, slowly dying off. Absolutely. You know? and, and to your point, what will take its place? It'll be very, very interesting. It won't be the same as what took its place before. And maybe it won't even be as many. But exactly. It'll be very, very interesting. Yeah. And the other interesting point that I thought in this interview that was very important was, as an industry, do we expect success too soon? Yeah. That, I think, is a major, major uh, issue. And what is success today? It's not the same as it was 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Exactly. Absolutely. So with that, insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our featured interview with Pete Anderson. Pete, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no sweat. Can you talk about the journey that your life took to becoming an agent in the music business? Well, I grew up in Idaho and uh, just went to a lot of shows when I was growing up because Boise is a perfectly routed city between Salt Lake and the Northwest Corridor. And I played in bands and I just, I was interested in music from an early age. And then I went to Vanderbilt University for college, which took me to Nashville, Tennessee. And I really had no idea what I wanted to study. Um, so I just, you know, had majors in psychology and anthropology. And uh, when I graduated, I took a job at Dell Computer. And Dell was a huge company. It still is a huge company, but it was really big then, publicly traded. Uh, there was 80,000 employees. And I worked in uh, a sales division at Dell that was for basic like uh, $500,000 to $10 billion IT budgets. And I'd go in there and we'd basically sell them their back end and all their laptops and desktops and networking equipment, et cetera. And I was doing well there, but I was really unhappy because I felt like uh, it just wasn't a creative endeavor. And I didn't really feel like it was something that I was destined to do. And that really got heightened uh, during a period of time when Dell Computer was uh, executing something called the Densification Project, which basically meant that um, you're in these cubicles, like literally just like thousands of people, and they're taking the cubicle and they're reducing it by six inches on all sides. Um, and so they started to do that, which obviously made everybody a little bit less comfortable. But then on top of that, halfway through it, they, they ceased the program without building the additional cubicles. And then they fired 40,000 employees. And uh, that was like, you know, I actually remained. I survived that, uh, that, that situation. But I, it was very demoralizing. It felt empty in those big office complexes. And I'd made friends with a guy, Barrett Sellers at William Morris, and he was a fraternity brother of mine back in college. But I was commiserating about this experience with him. And he was like, man, you know, like if you wanted to give it a shot being an agent, you know, uh, I'd be happy to slip him your resume. So did, did you know what an agent was? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd known Barrett and Barrett, you know, he worked at, uh, you know, when he was at Vanderbilt, he put on the Rites of Spring Festival, which is a college run festival. And I'd sort of watched his career blossom. He, he's one of the rare figures that I think knew from a very young age that he wanted to do this. And so when he got out of college, he basically went right into it. And uh, he knew me. He knew that I liked to go to shows, that I had uh, a, a knowledge of music, and that I was a good salesman. And so he gave me a shot, and I started at the William Morris Mailroom, and I uh, worked my way up uh, to agent trainee. And uh, finished my career there working for Greg Oswald. And at the time, he was Taylor Swift's agent. So that was one of the last tours that I serviced when I was at William Morris was the uh, Fearless Tour. And then uh, in the meantime, when I had been working for the last three years at William Morris, I joined an organization called Solid. And two of my best friends there, uh, John Romero and Heath Bomar. Heath is an agent at APA. John's a manager at Vector. Um, I had started to develop this crew of friends that weren't necessarily working at William Morris. They were all over the spectrum. Some of them were at CAA, some of them were, you know, at record labels. And uh, Heath was working on rock and electronic stuff over at APA. And so I was attracted to that and went to APA to work with him on a small roster of rock clients. And it wasn't it wasn't working to spec. Um, and mainly it's because you know, we had this small group of agents in Nashville, Tennessee, trying to make contemporary music uh, when the centers of those of those genre focuses were in New York City and Los Angeles. And Nashville, by and large, was a country music department. So it was sort of a poor fit for that. And at one point, the leadership at APA elected to just sort of change what they were doing and let go a bunch of those agents. And they kept me in Heath. And they kept Heath in Nashville and asked if I wanted to move out to Los Angeles to... Um, be a contemporary music agent here. And so I took that 
and I moved out here seven years ago. And um, for the bulk of my period at APA, I was covering the West Coast territory as a booking agent. And I booked everything from rock to hip hop to electronic. Um, and uh, I've been doing that to various territorial sizes. At one point, I was doing Alaska all the way to Texas. So a huge swath of territory um, comprising Western Canada, Washington, Oregon, you know, all the way down to Texas. And um, it's been very fulfilling. But at the same time, uh, just my own genre focus was a poor fit at APA. I was signing a lot of uh, sort of counterculture genre music, psychedelic rock, dark ambient music, disco, um, house. And APA was an agency and still is an agency today that doesn't necessarily have that kind of top line or that focus. Um, they, they have more of an adult contemporary focus than anything else. And um, uh, so I was having a, an interesting time servicing my clients because, you know, when you're getting a tour avail and you pitch for a tour, you know, that's sort of, there's a lot of chances, a lot of variables that can swing that for you. Um, one of which is, does the artist that you're pitching for like the music of the other? That's the biggest variable. But then it's like, who's the record label is involved? What kind of marketing is going to be done? How many other people are you uh, contending for, uh, for that slot? And I wanted to sort of be able to guarantee my artists uh, different, um, you know, situations to break their music and their career as touring musicians. So I started signing club nights. And um, the very first one that I signed was a group called Lights and Music Collective. And they have a bunch of parties under their profile, but the, probably the most famous one is Dance Yourself Clean, which is a weekly in Los Angeles, Seattle, and Portland, and a monthly in New York. And this is a party that's, you know, dedicated to, you know, indie electropop as epitomized by the band LCD Sound System. So basically that influence of music as a party with lasers and moving lights and really good branding and marketing. And I would put my bands on these on these properties and then I would tour the properties. And uh, so that was my first experience like signing branded nights, which is sort of what has led me to today and what I do and why I've ventured out on my own and created Earth to Peter. Yeah, I guess there was an area that you were serving that was not being served. I guess being at APA and with their adult contemporary focus uh, didn't lend itself for the other bands, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I think APA was definitely entertaining the idea of, of or and I think they still are, of developing their contemporary music roster. Um, but I'm not a hip-hop agent, and I'm not like, you know, a classic rock agent, and I'm not doing those kinds of things. Like I'm signing artists like She Wants Revenge, um, you know, which is sort of a darker rock band. Uh, they're in the vein of like a Depeche Motor and Interpol. But, you know, interesting about that is Adam Braven from She Wants Revenge. You know, he's been supporting himself for, you know, several decades with his club nights in Los Angeles. So there again, it sort of falls into my purview of breaking nights. Like we have Cloak and Dagger, which is a Tuesday night members only club series in Los Angeles. That's dark rock, dark industrial, dark wave, minimalist German techno uh, with an immersive theatrical component. And we've built that into a music festival in LA. We have Giorgio's, which is another members only party uh, dedicated to the, uh, the influence of Giorgio Moroder, who's another one of my clients. And so that's, you know, so that's like um, disco, electronic, indie electropop. Um, and that's also a private guest list only situation uh, behind the kitchen at the Standard in West Hollywood. So, you know, every client that I pick up has some sort of element of that, of having a night, a brand that we can build into a festival property and uh, subsidize the career in that very unique way. Um, so that's, I think, why uh, it's sort of difficult for me to... Uh, you know, work in, a, in the bounds of an agency like APA. Right. No, it's very interesting. Uh, Pete, let me ask you, from your perspective as an agent, is this a healthy time for live music right now? Um, yes and no. Uh, I think there are, are many more touring musicians than have ever been around in the history of the music industry. Um, there are so many options. There are so many venues. There are so many festivals. Um, but it continues to grow, I think, generally as an industry. But, you know, uh, that middle class of artists is starting to, uh, get the, the lifestyle is getting more difficult. The guarantees are going down, et cetera. And especially for counterculture stuff, like that's why, you know, 
in terms of how, how do you properly develop an artist in that world, you really got to get them immersed in the communities. You know, it's like Desert Days with Juju or like Levitation with Black Angels. You know, these are successful festival and touring entities that are built by artists, for artists, to support genres of music that aren't necessarily on the radio. Um, because right now what's popular, uh, if you're just following the zeitgeist, is country, hip-hop, uh, and electronic. And pop, of course. But a lot of more musicians than fall in those genre focuses. But you know what's interesting, Pete, in listening to you is that I'm, I'm realizing is as you were speaking about that and talking about the counterculture element is that from a live perspective, I mean, I've been in the business for it's 40 years this year. And wow. Yeah. And, and the thing that I noticed the most is that, you know, when you talk about the genres, it's fascinating to me that, you know, the one genre that I have seen that has and I'm sure it's not the it's not going to be the last, it's, but it's the first to come up and evolve itself culturally through the internet as a viable uh, musical entity was electronica, electronic music. That is an, a, a genre that came up through the internet. It did not come up through the traditional means. It came up through total counterculture. It came up through, you know, streaming. It came up not even through streaming, but through, you know, giveaway and through raves and through a whole mm -hmm. series of historic elements culturally that, you know, made the giant stars of today. And, and, and there's been lots of them, you know, over the over the last 15, 20 years. And, you know, I look and I think like, you know, the space that you're in, it just seems like as difficult as it may be. Uh, I was watching a documentary this morning on Woodstock and they were talking about how, you know, the majority of the acts outside of like, you know, maybe the top, there were 36 acts that performed at the original Woodstock. Only like five or six of them were even, you know, well known uh, at the, you know, the who and Joan Baez and, you know, Hendrix and, but, you know, and that was it. The rest of them were, like, not known. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing, are you seeing growth in, in the field that you're in, even though it's challenging today from a, from a live perspective? Are you seeing growth within those counterculture elements and within lifestyle uh, elements? Absolutely. I mean, I, so the way that I, I witness that is in what our audiences are willing to pay for more experiential events and things that feel a little bit more organic and real. Um, because, you know, th there are so many touring artists and so many of the shows, like, in my opinion, aren't really up to the, up to the new, you know, they're not up to the quality of like creating a visceral experience between you and wh whoever you're watching, you know? And uh, some of that visceral experience was probably like Woodstock, I mean, that was a historic moment, you know, and that that experience uh, has so ingrained itself in, in music lore that it's, you know, now it's like this legendary beast that apparently we cannot redo ever again. Right. You know? right. Literally. 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 I mean, my, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just witnessed that. Um, but, you know, like going to a, a, you know, a rock festival like Burger Records Festival Burger Rama in Oakland is so vastly different than going to something like Coachella. Like they're not even they're not even in the same world. I mean, this is this is a, a, a record label that squarely focuses on garage rock, um, experimental genres, um, noise, uh, psychedelic genres of music, desert rock. Um, you know, Graham Parsons sort of desert style uh, country music, all that stuff. And the audiences that they draw are real music lovers. And they are, are people that are artistic and creative and, and love community. And these people all come together. Uh, you know, and John Waters is up there hosting. And it's just a, it's, it's just a, sort of a, it's a completely different niche of people that exist all over the world. Which is why you see Burger Records also doing like Burger Invasion of Europe, where they're playing, you know, Cologne, uh, you know, and Munich, and you know, not only bringing bands over from the United States, but also tapping into those local scenes. So the way the way that I see growth is that I see these huge festivals like Coachella and Lollapalooza and ACL, um, their lineups sort of becoming one and the same because they're all looking for those huge artists that are really just acing radio. You know, you're getting Ariana Grande on festival lineups. Which uh, would on the be, headliner slots, yeah. Yeah, yeah which, you, which would be unheard of like back in like the 90s. Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. with the way that the festival started. And I, so I see, I see the festival industry sort of drifting in both those directions. 
one, there's going to be a more pop focus for huge festivals like Coachella. And then there's going to be all these festivals developing like Desert Days, like Levitation, like Lightning in a Bottle um, that are taking from the Burning Man, the Burner crowd, you know, um, or like the psychedelic rock lovers or like, you know, uh, the goth kids, the industrial kids, the weirdos, you know. Um, so I do I do see uh, a growth in that industry in both labels, manager, management companies, agencies and festival buyers that are going to accept that responsibility. I, w- I want to talk to you. I, w- I want to ask you like a, a, a personal professional question, which is. You know, what is your criteria for taking on new clients? I mean, you know, do you take on artists who are unsigned or that are independent? And what is it exactly that you're looking for or that has to be present for you in order to say, this is somebody who I'm I'm seriously considering taking on? Well, number one, I have to like it. I like, um, I mean, the way that my mom would describe me and my brother growing up is my brother was, at, was Athens and I was Sparta. <laughs> meaning okay. that he was rational and I sort of I sort of feel my way forward but I I really have to be passionate about something to take it on I really have to love it and um I have to see the vision I have to be able to create a plan but really what I'm looking for are are, are visionaries in subgenres of music that I can create business models around to build their business and so a really good example of that is Phil Peroni um Phil is the founder and owner of Desert Days uh, he created that party single-handedly. Well, not single-handedly. I mean, he's had a lot of help along the way, but he was the originator of this party that's grown into a 10,000 capacity a day music festival in Lake Paris, California. And he did that by booking, you know, uh, classic punk rock bands, uh, psychedelic bands, uh, experimental bands, garage rock bands, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of different stuff. And creating Desert Days, which is sort of a tribute to the Joshua Tree desert environment in California and that sort of psychedelic landscape and then also just the culture of it. Um, He also has a band called Juju, which is incredible. They're a great psychedelic rock band. We've had them out with Mastodon and Primus and uh, the Claypool Lennon Delirium and the Temples. And one of the things that I was able to build for him was something called the Desert Days Caravan, which is basically a, a traveling version of the festival itself and you know we 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 tour that just like we tour any other branded property by bringing in the right promoters and then uh you know basically creating a wad of money and distributing that through the artists that play uh but we provide cohesive branding and and marketing support and some of the art installations and and artists and marketing from the desert days festival itself and you see other festivals doing that like like levitation is also touring that entity you know, if they don't in Vancouver and Denver and uh, other cities like that. Um, but yeah, so I, I look for, I, I primarily work with artists that I can, I can develop something like that with. Um, some of them are that anyway. Like I just signed Fleet Mac Wood, which is like a, sort of a house disco, very disco oriented remix project of uh, Fleetwood Mac. And it's just a, an incredible understanding of their catalog uh, an awareness of the bohemian uh, culture and also how Fleetwood Mac really uh, ep- epitomized sort of the um, just the the gluttony of the baby boomer era <laughs> <laughs> um, in a very clever, very amazing way um, because that was sort of a magical era in music and in yes, culture. I remember and, it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that'll never be recreated, you know? Well, it was a different time. And also, Mm -hmm. you know, Fleetwood Mac wasn't that from the beginning. They were a blues band that evolved into what you're saying. Right. They became the epitome of, I think, what you just articulated, uh, you know, at their zenith. Yeah, right. You know? Let me ask you... Turn around the world in 747s. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The the excess, you know, and battling battling the Eagles for number one position, you know, between rumors and Hotel California. I mean, it was, you know, who can sell more this week? (laughs) Yeah, but those... I mean, that project, the reason I bring it up is because they are also promoters. They are promoter and DJs that Ah. have been in the business for a long time. And we promote our own parties in that situation. So instead of selling that to a promoter, we're literally like getting promoter deals and then we're marketing it and promoting ourselves. Um, and it's, it's to that very specific demographic of people that would love to go to a party like that. 
where they're, you know, anyway. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Let me ask you, notwithstanding talent, what are the top three non-creative characteristics that you look for in a client when you're considering them taking them on? Um, a work ethic and an attention to detail. You also mentioned, you know, when I when I asked you the thing of the things that you look for in cl- new clients, you said a vision, which I think is very very important. You're looking. You said a vision of something that you know I can market or work with, and that's something that I think. A lot of artists think it's it's all about talent. Well, talent is one thing. A lot of people have talent, but if you don't have the vision of what you want to do with that talent, you know, it's very hard for, you know, people like you who are the pros to even do something with it. It's like, you know, that and, and I think that's a very important point that you brought up about vision because it's not necessarily the manager, you know, so many artists think that it's the manager or the agent or the promoter or whatever that's gonna give them the career. Yeah. I, I mean I couldn't agree more. I like Itchio uh, is a new client of mine that has an unbelievable vision. Uh, they are from Denver, where you know this year they're going to close out the year selling seven thousand tickets at an average thirty-five dollars. Um, Live Nation is producing one of their festivals called Hollow Mass at Summit. It's a three-day music festival. It's going to sell out. Um, these guys have forty-four members in their band, uh, <laughs> wow. and they they have Tycho drummers, drum battery. Um, they got you know a Tesla coil that's live during the duration of the performance, pyro, um, custom uh, instruments strapped to the back of, uh, of members wandering throughout the crowd, scaring the shit out of them. They're all masked. <laughs> I hope you it's have a like, lot of insurance for that tour. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's, it's electronic and it's rock and it's punk and it's like all these things mixed together and it's just a really powerful visceral experience. And uh, you know, the, the guy, the creative director behind this thing, the creative behind it, you know, when he, it's, it, it's, it's daunting to sign a project like that because the writer that you have to address and, and the kind of money you have to raise in order to support a property like that in the first place. And like you said, like the liability, like we need Tesla coils 14 feet <laughs> yeah, I was away, just from, say, yeah. away from moving lights at a minimum. And, and you know, hope that there's no lightning in the forecast. Yeah, we got to hang this in a place where it's not going to electrocute somebody. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a daunting project to take on something like that. And I'm not the genius behind it, but I have to be able to understand it well enough to sell it and then to set it up correctly so that it doesn't, so that it executes well. And you know, my creative on that has such a vision that, you know, he's dictating to me all these different things that I got to do. And he's, you know, it's, it's one of those things like there's two ways to respond to, to situations where you're getting that kind of directive that intensely and that consistently. And one is to get annoyed by it and to shut it off and be like, man, this fucking ain't worth it. Sorry. I didn't mean to cuss. No, that's okay. You can, yeah, but it's not worth it. You know? Um, and to just not take on a project like that. The other alternative is to say, you know what, I'm going to take this as a learning experience. I'm going to learn all this stuff and I'm going to execute it perfectly so that my client's getting what he wants per spec and I can grow this. Because if this becomes a, 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 an entity that's selling 7,000 tickets across the United States like it is in Denver, then I've got I've got a real property on him. Yeah, and a property that can grow that's that that 25 other people are not doing. Yeah, and that expertise like in 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 uh, agenting something like that also lends expertise to the other clients that I'm booking. They're trying to create shows like that, like Cloak and Dagger, you know? Like we have all kinds of crazy production uh, considerations with Cloak and Dagger, which has an immersive theatrical aspect to it. We're literally hiring actors that have a storyline and a script about how to pull people from this festival or from this club into the darker corridors of whatever venue we're using so we can do crazy rituals or seances or whatever we're trying to do. You know, I mean, a lot of it has to do with my fascination with haunted houses and with being scared and being excited and having adrenaline rushes. And um, to that extent, I'm willing to listen to the creators behind that and try to try to understand what they're trying to do and then to execute that for them because that gives me a proper vision. That gives me a, th- a, a list of things to do. Right. You, you know, it, it, in, in listening to you, it, it makes it, I want to ask sort of a fundamental question, which is, you know, at, at what point then should an artist be at 
I mean, you, you, you've sort of articulated where, where a lot of these visions are in terms of what they're doing. Where should an artist be at or a group or an entity be at before they consider touring? Is there, is there a place in your mind where they should be at before that's, that's even considered? Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that in the beginning, I, I, a lot of artists, you know, they, they finish their project and they're, they want to debut it so badly and they're so anxious to do that. And what I would suggest is to really be considerate of how you release that music into the world and consider it to yourself mainly because it's all the you know just years of talent your entire lifetime of effort into developing and honing this craft and you're you're excited about it naturally but if you just release something without having a marketing plan behind it or you know it, it's it's like a tree falling in the woods with no one around to hear it, it doesn't make a sound and so i think you know obviously it's do you have a label? Do you have any kind of marketing vehicle for it? Can I put them into uh, the communities that are going to support it? Like, is Levitation going to support it in Austin? Is Desert Days going to support it in, like, you know, in Southern California? Am I going to get Cloak and Dagger to embrace this and put them on our parties in London, Mexico City, and LA? I mean, I need to know that kind of thing because if I if I can find an artist where radio is not as important. And I can instead get them involved with the right people that can help, you know, broadcast your music throughout the world. Then I know I've got something that I can tour. Um, but if I'm hearing from those communities that it's not a it's not a good fit, um, and you know, I don't have a business model to go after, and I don't have any marketing for the record or anything like that, it's very difficult for me to look at a project. And I'll also, especially because a lot of the artists that I sign are sort of fathers of their genres. Like I have the Crystal Method, you know. I've got Giorgio Moroder. I have Sarone, who's the father of French touch disco. I have Mark Frina, who created mushroom jazz. Like he created an entire genre of music that spawned record labels and as far off as Singapore. So it's like, I, I, I don't tend to sign a lot of developing artists and I, I, and it's not because I don't support or embrace that. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to support the structures, the clubs, the club nights, the festivals that are going to support that. Hey, Insiders, we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way. But before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. Hey, Rich, you're the founder, CEO, legend of Music Business Registry. Tell us what the Music Business Registry is all about. Well, what it's about, Eric, is it's a company that is designed to provide the most accurate and up-to-date contact information for the music business. So if someone is looking to reach the A&R community, if someone is looking to reach music publishers, if someone needs to reach artist managers, if someone needs to reach music attorneys, if someone's looking to place their music into film and television and needs to reach all the music supervisors, that's the contact information that we provide. We've been doing it for 28 years. We're sort of the industry standard, if you will, uh, for the music business uh, and, and have been serving them since 1992. So that's what we do. Amazing. So if I wanted to find out, let's say uh, A&R uh, people from uh, Warner Brothers, let's say, I can just go in there and find that in the A&R registry? Absolutely. You'll find all of the Warner Brothers in there. You'll find the Warner Brothers in LA, Warner Brothers in New York, Warner Brothers in Nashville, Warner Brothers in London, Warner Brothers, you know, probably in Australia as well. So those are the, the main territories that we cover. Amazing. And we're offering all of our insiders right now that are listening, if you visit musicregistry.com, and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll get a 10% discount off your first order. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. Anything else you want to say, Rich? Well, when you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. You know. Precisely, yes. And, you know, it's interesting listening to you because what you're talking about is, I, I listened, Midem puts on all of their panels now online the day that they are presented. And one mm. of the more interesting ones that I listened to was a panel on distribution from um, Troy Carter. You know, Troy Carter's the, uh, the yeah. guy behind Lady Gaga, and then he worked at Spotify, and now he's got a company called Q&A. And he was saying, I mean, what you were just saying about, you know, the the, 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 the whole context of, of music and, and what needs to be there, he was talking about with today, he said the number one problem with so much music today is he said, it's not only the volume, the number one problem is that there's too much music out there with no context. There's too. He said, when I was at Spotify, there's too much shit being thrown up and for the sake of being thrown up. 
and 100%. It's like, yeah, and it's, it's and, and from what I'm listening to you, what you just said, Pete, was interesting because it's like there's just too many acts that, you know, don't have what you're talking about, which is that sense of community, that community around them, whether that community is a specific musical style or an online community or something that needs to be there that you can plug into. And it seems like all the clients you have have plugged into a specific community. I mean, Giorgio's the godfather of, you know, electronic disco. And, and, in, and he was the innovator of that at a time when, you know, there was just him and Kraftwerk, maybe, you know, uh, the, the different kind of movements you're speaking about, Mushroom and so forth. So that's the interesting part is, is developing the context around it. And he said that that's an important element for artists to do today in music. Otherwise, it's just noise and you're just contributing to the noise. But, you know, developing something out of that is so difficult. He he talked about the challenges of creating a context and getting people to pay attention to it. He said that's the real challenge today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't, yeah, well said. But it's also, you know, it's like there's a big difference between like hip hop and country and pop and like, you know, like psychedelic rock, right? Because like country is its own culture as well. Exactly, you know? yes. And that is part yeah. of the context. Yeah, but rock and roll is the most multifaceted genre ever, like that and electronic. And so much of it is counterculture oriented that, you know, instead of focusing on, oh, this is a rock club or this is a rock festival, right? That's such a broad definition. What we're focused on is Cloak and Dagger, which is a dark ambient movement. So. It covers all those genres you spoke about earlier, but it's also got an all-black dress code. And uh, and the people that are that are interested in this have uh, alternative lifestyles, you know. And we welcome people from all walks of life. But the only way you can be given membership at Cloak and Dagger is if you're offered membership. Okay. You know, you can't you can't get it. You can't buy it. You have to be invited into it. Yes. Interesting. So it's so it's like, but that's a, its own community, and it's comprised of goth kids and industrial kids and electronic kids and even immersive theatrical kids i mean it's it's a wild community um and very creative but instead of being like oh well these are you know industrial 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 we're brought we're broadening it a little bit to the lifestyle that embraces that whole collection of music because you'll hear britney spears on a cloak and dagger set and you'll be like wow that's crazy it didn't consider britney spears to be dark or some people who are following a little bit closer maybe know them Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, um, today we see so many acts who have significant audiences that aren't necessarily famous. How are they finding their audience? Um, I, it's, it's the same way that they make music. It's, it's, the, coll- it's the collective, you know. I mean, it, you, you meet one person that bounces off to a few more people and, you know, you're making music together and then they're playing a show and they invite you on. And it, it, it grows that way in the beginning. And... Um, you know, you'll, you'll play events for like local clubs and that thing, but really like your content has to resonate. That's, that's the absolute key at this moment in time, because no matter what you're doing, like if you're on tour supporting a huge headliner, you know, a good conversion rate is like 3% of the audience, you know, meaning that 3% of that audience is going to go home and like you on Facebook and buy a ticket to your show next time you play in town. There's no guarantee that that entire audience, and chances are they're not, are going to embrace your music. So you have to have a way of hitting that audience uh, so that they're actually consuming you as well, not just witnessing you in one moment in time. So, you know, I, I, I think that um, artists should be precious about the recorded music and about the way that it's released and about the people that are involved in doing that. And I see... Um, sort of these niche vectors like the lightning into the bottles of the world becoming, you know, sort of ways of releasing that music as well. And I'm not speaking for lightning in a bottle, but there are going to be, you know, festivals like that. They're going to be releasing music. There's going to be entities like Kind Heaven in Las Vegas. They're going to be releasing geocentric genres of music. It'll, the, it's it's going to be really interesting as the immersive, the interactive, the community aspect of these niche genres really comes into focus. In terms of building fan bases today, who do you think is doing it right? What examples can you give us of people that are that are building their audience in the correct way? Well, I don't think anybody um, could disagree with Billie Eilish, uh, who's, I mean, she's on fire. 
Yeah, uh, that, that's the classic model that took yeah three years of building that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, it it took her a very short period of time, but I think a lot of that has to do with the the music that she's creating and its uh, appeal to so many different people. I mean, pop, dark ambient, like psychedelic garage. I mean, every every kind of she's got fans from all ages and all niches and it's also pop i mean it's wild she's changed the face of pop is what you're saying yes she has and that is something that you know very very i mean you know i remember back in the early 80s when prince did that that's something that that is very 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 difficult to do it's rare yeah and you know i i think they've it sounds like she makes really good smart business decisions and um you know i'm I, I'm in awe of that project. I thought that's that's done really well. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's a tough time for a lot of bands right now. Uh, a lot of bands that specifically have guitars, um, and not all the bands that are making it in that guitar world, I think, are as worthy as some of the ones that have been just clawing away at it for years. <laughs> and that's because I've got a, 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 an esoteric taste. You know, I really do. I like. I I don't. It's it's hard for me to uh, be naturally inclined to sign a pop act. Uh, just you know, with my taste and right, just by your nature of your style of what you like. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, really, like the careers that I'm I'm watching, which I which are interesting, are more along the lines of like artists that are creating pathways to building the, building out the entire community of music. You know. Um, like one of them is Elro, so you should you should both Google it. You should check it out. Uh, but it's a party night uh, from Ibiza, and it's basically taking over the world of electronic. And it's doing it because it's creating such an explosive experience for their crowds. And it is it you you must understand that the the guys that are behind this, they are promoters, they are producers, they are creatives, and they are artists. So they're booking DJs. But they're creating this entire immersive reality with characters and puppets and people dressed up and dance and just celebration. And the, the kind of jubilation that they're creating, that visceral experience, I'm in awe of that. And I'm, I'm also signing artists like that, like Itch.io, you know, uh, which is a very explosive experience. Like when people go, when people don't know what that is and they walk into that environment, they will leave forever changed. And um, those are the careers that I'm watching very closely are, are entities like that and the, and the bands that play those and the DJs that participate in that. Because oftentimes the DJs are also the promoters. Um, you know, Fleet Mac Wood off of my roster is doing that right now. You know, they're selling over 1,500 tickets in three markets already in the United States, uh, 500 tickets in others. Um, but it is it is a growing entity, and it's something that they promote, they market, they're developing this this fan base of people that are part of this community that is in awe of the bohemian <laughs> baby uh, boomer era. And it's it's wild because it, it a, 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 you know it appeals to people that are 18 years old all the way up to like 72, 75. You know, it's a it's a wild and it's the same thing that Billie Eilish is doing, but they're doing it from a more experiential way. I mean, it's not the same thing that Billie Eilish is doing. What I'm saying is, it's got the same swath of appeal. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pete, as an industry, we're we're seeing an enormous amount of legacy acts that are leaving the live space. You know. ACDC, Elton John, Kiss, Peter Frampton, Aerosmith, on and on and on. It doesn't seem like there's an apparatus today to create the legacy acts of the future. What are you seeing from your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, that that is an alarming thing. Because um, you're also talking about the artists that created the modern day music industry. Yeah. You know, the modern day music industry is not that old. I mean, you're talking like 60s on, right? Right, yeah. And uh, that's interesting because those the guy, the same agents, the same managers, the same record label executives are still there, uh, and they're they're still the leaders of the agencies and the whole thing. And so I think what's changing is the kind of infrastructure that is needed to break music, and the way that listeners are becoming fans. So like a lot of a lot of uh, what you're seeing today are Instagram celebrities and um, things like that, which is kind of interesting. Um, and also, 
with the sort of um, social aspect of music sharing and the, at the speed at which that can travel, I think that you're finding a lot of crowds find their music and then the industry trying to uh, catch up. You know, they're trying to they're trying to spot they're trying to objectively spot spikes in popularity for various musics, and then they're trying to get that and then try to grow that bigger um, instead of finding a, a, a naturally talented artist and developing it from the ground up. I think that that's a troubling trajectory that I'm seeing in the industry, and I think that the net of what that's going to be is that we're going to have I think what's going to be a, a diversification of the industry where a lot of niches are going to develop and it to be bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's going to be more niche in the future. A lot more niches. Let, let me ask you from your perspective as an agent, Pete, do you think as an industry, we expect success too soon? 100%. I think that uh, there's a lot, there's so much pressure put on kids to succeed before they're 30, which is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you know, insane. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, that's with musicians, too. I mean, a lot of really talented people, they put in two, five years, ten years, and then they get fed up and walk away. Um, I was actually meeting with an artist yesterday, and we were talking about this, and he's telling me, oh, I'm looking for a, a, a steady gig. And I was like, oh, like a residency? <laughs> get in he goes, no. He's like, it's like a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I was, like, I was like, dude, you know, if you're looking for a job, you should just look for a job. Like 100%, like get the job, go get the job because there, there are a billion artists that can only do this. This is the only thing they can do. It's all they know. Yeah. It's it. And you're going to, you're going to fail when you're competing against people like that. Absolutely. You know? Um, so I, I, I do think it's going to, there's going to be a separation and, and people are going to be able to less reliably do this as a hobby because everything's becoming more expensive. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't survive on nothing for forever. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. You're right. You know, today for an actor or artist who's in the process of building their, uh, their career, can you offer any insights into the most effective ways to help build fan bases and live attendance? I think uh, it's about the vision. And, and a, a key aspect of that vision is understanding your crowd, your audience, and then um, identifying creative ways that you can get in front of that audience and doing it any way that you can. Um, you know, uh, I don't think that, I think that artists should be careful about headlining too early. You know, I think they should really be focused on, uh, supporting artists that they think, uh, share their, share in their community. Uh, because it's, it, at the end of the day, it's a very collective effort, uh, both in the creation of music, but also the marketing of that and the sales of that, um, all aspects of it. And I think that they should hold on to that collective idea uh, and, and apply it to the vision. Okay. Let me ask you, how, how important are colleges and festivals in terms of building an artist's life career? Well, um, it depends on the genre. Uh, it, festivals are extremely important. There's a lot of music discovery that happens in music festivals, um, which can mint lifelong fans because that kind of surprise element and when you stumble upon something that really has an impression on you, that you'll remember. And you'll apply to your taste in music. Um, so I think festivals, absolutely. Colleges, um, college festivals, absolutely. Um, I don't tend to uh, target colleges too often because my audiences tend to be a little bit older. Like, um, you know, my average demographic is in the late 20s to like 50s, honestly, um, because we, you know, uh, DJ a lot of music. Um, from the 80s and the 70s, um, you know, like we have, you know, Sisters of Mercy, and we've got uh, the Jesus and Mary chain, and you know, right. yeah, those are, like, yeah, those are like from the 80s, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And these younger generations, like the way that they're discovering music, like the the social media uh, bonanza of of minting artists, that's not something that my parties are really tapped into too much. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, a, a, a part of my focus is also selling stuff or signing stuff and and um, monetizing properties that you know the major agencies aren't going after because <laughs> they they are 
they're all going after that 16 to 22 year old demographic because it's the it's the most profitable demographic in music and they should be <laughs> you know right but at the same time pete it's a very 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 crowded market yes it is <laughs> you know yeah. and it's getting more you know bob left sets said a very very interesting thing which i never forgot he said you know the whole concept of you know the 16 to 22 and pop music he said it's becoming more and more expensive to produce it to an audience that is um, that fewer and fewer people care about, you know, within that market. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's, <laughs> he says, you look at a number one pop record by a Beyonce today versus a number one record by a Lionel Richie. And I mean, the, the numbers are staggeringly different. I mean, like enorm, vastly different in terms of reach and impact. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, and, and to your point that it's just, you know, going after the 16 to 22, that's, Okay, but, you know, uh, I think we've also discussed in this conversation that, you know, the 16 to 22 is far broader uh, in their tastes and interests today, especially for all the reasons you've articulated, than ever before. They're also broke. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very, very good I, point. They don't have 60. Yeah, I mean, you go look at a Coachella uh, audience. It is not 16-year-olds. There are a lot of those, too. I mean, th there's there's plenty of parents that are willing to, like, buy their kid a Coachella ticket and pray that everything turns out okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean... But you're serving a market in your business that's being underserved, so you're finding those niches and really kind of exposing those and building businesses, which I thought was so beautifully put that you're building a business around that. And and, and these audiences also are capable of, of paying a more premium ticket and totally willing to do so for the experience. Like, the immersive theatrical aspect of the industry is really interesting to me because... Um, I know producer directors in LA that are their average ticket price is in the two hundred and twenty five dollar range, and they're selling out. You look at something like Sleep No More in, in New York that's had, that's been around for seven years now, and their average tickets like three hundred dollars, and they're like sold out most every night. I mean, that is a crazy project, um, and people are doubling down on that industry. I mean, you have Perry Farrell and the immersive artistry team opening up Kind Heaven in Las Vegas which is that sort of mystic um, Asian themed, uh, you know, multi room project that has hip hop and electronic and rock and roll. And, you know, people are, people are willing to pay for, for experiences that are more meaningful, more intangible, <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. Less of just going to a random club and seeing a random band, you know, not elicit a reaction. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Are, are there more opportunities opening up in international markets? Do you see that? Absolutely. I mean, um, you're seeing it today with like K-pop and uh, everything that's coming out of South Korea and Japan. And I mean, that stuff is dominating right now. Um, and I can see that happening with Southeast Asian markets. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's interesting to me specifically happening out of Singapore a record label called darker than wax. Um, that's sort of got this, uh, sort of trip hop mushroom jazz, uh, aspect to it that I also share with my roster with artists like Chinese man and Mark Farina. Um, so I, I'm interested in that counterculture that's developing there, but there's a lot of like psychedelic music, uh, coming out of, uh, Thailand, uh, that's really awesome. Um, you know, you have Krang Bin, which is a, um, you know, uh, a Thai-based psychedelic rock band touring the United States doing really well. I actually think they live in Austin, Texas, but uh, the origination is Thai. Um, anyway, I think that's all fascinating uh, in international markets. Um, it's difficult. Uh, and also, like, with the dark ambient scene in Berlin. Like, I mean, there are festivals like this in Belgium, like Wave to Synth Festival in Entremurlis in Portugal that are really supporting that, that kind of community. So it's, it's great for me. And I see Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran doing record setting business internationally. So I can only see that these markets are going to continue to open up. Let me ask you then if, if based on what you're saying today, more than ever, it seems like an artist's career, I guess is truly a global business. And as such, do you need a relationship with a variety of international agencies for your clients? That's sort of the first part. And then the second part is do you find that certain international markets are more open to specific styles of music or artists than others? Definitely. I think it's way easier to be a rock band in Europe today than it is in America. Um, I mean, you can just look at the festival lineups alone. Uh, but um, 
as far as like, yes. Uh, so the agency business has always been territorial because there, there's only so many promoters, so many markets, so much niche understanding of what genres those promoters support in every market. Because, uh, you know, a house electronic promoter is going to be vastly different than a psychedelic rock promoter that's going to be different than a goth promoter that's going to be different than like a, a tech house promoter. You know what I mean? All in the same market and potentially all going into the same room, you know? And to have an awareness of all those different subgenres and who's going to be good at promoting what. And then also to know all the venues and to know all the markets that feed into every market. I mean, you replicate that around the world and that's too much information for one human to process. Oh, absolutely. Even if you're, yeah. even if you're Steve Strange. <laughs> yeah, right. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that guy's a maniac. I don't know how he does it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I represent several of my artists internationally. Uh, she Wants Revenge, Mark Frain of The Crystal Method. And um, I have a lot of success in finding partners that help me in each territory. Um, you know, whether it's Daisuke in Tokyo for contact or like, um, you know, uh, going into Elro with Barcelona or going into Barcelona with Elro. Right, me. right. Um, so you find those partners and they also naturally find you. Because and especially in like um, the counterculture genres, because you know the artist sampling is smaller, so people tend to find each other, um, and that's helpful. But you definitely should uh, look at building specific teams. Like find yourself a European agent, find yourself an Australian agent, right? Find yourself a North American agent. <laughs> yeah, somebody that knows that region and knows it better than you know than you would. I think so. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Aside from selling music to fans, are there any services that enable artists to sell uh, tickets, such as merchandise, CD bundling with the tickets? Yeah, I'm sure those exist. Um, I don't necessarily use those. Um, I, I do. I do make use. So, like for example, like Cloak and Dagger. Cloak and Dagger is a weekly club night, but it's also a quarterly. Like, I mean, it's like a monthly publicly sold like small club night, and then it's a quarterly large club night, and then it's an annual festival, all in the city of Los Angeles. And the entire thing is based off of our membership. So the membership, you know, a lot of that is. It, like those experiences are free. We don't charge people to like go into our club night and enjoy themselves. That's a free experience for them. Okay. But that membership is how we basically build all these other events. So they pay a got, membership fee. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. But, um, but not just that they also buy tickets to our events at a reduced price and they also provide the backbone and the reason for what we do. Um, and, you know, there's there's merchandising elements of that. That's what there I was just going to ask, if there's merch tie-ins. And there's, all ki there's all kinds of stuff yeah. that's tied in. And they that. support but, that, obviously, because, you know, yeah. Well, because because it's also organic. Right. It's, I mean, the, the, we're, not like, we're not like signing a deal with Nike. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, yeah, no. right. We're not, we're not like uh, underwritten by Microsoft. Right. You know, it's, we're not doing stuff like that. It's it's way more organic. It's way more part of the community. It's uh, very much targeted towards fashion and um, and music and lifestyle. Can you share any ways that acts can promote themselves in cities in which they've never played? And I guess I'm asking that because you said you, you represent a lot of acts internationally. And I, I guess there must be some point when an act is going into a territory where they've never played. Or, or do you leave that up to the promoter? to provide any kind of marketing or, or uh, promotion for the act? Well, ideally, everybody's working together. Um, the, promo the promoter, the artist, the agent, and they're not getting offended by that process because, you know, there's a lot of interlap between what a promoter and what an agent and what a band should be doing, you know? And each situation is different. Are we carrying a supporting artist or are we relying on local support? And what are the good reasons for doing each of those? You know, when we're opening up a new market, is it wise to bring in local bands to support the headliner and get the word out among those communities? Um, is it smart to be talking to radio stations? Is it smart to be talking to record stores? Um, you know, should we be flyering events that are of similar vibe? Um, you know, are we aligning ourselves with the proper interviews with blogs, you know, that cover music in that area? 
are we announcing the show correctly? Can people see it? You know, like, are you on the LA weeklies of the world, the scene magazines, you know, because, because people that want to go to the stuff are going to be looking for it too. You know, I mean, you're not shoving anything down anyone's throat and music is such a, is such a different industry than any other because nobody wants to be sold music. People want to choose music. And so the sales psychology of that, you know, people that sell cars and just jam them down your throats, that's not going to work in the music industry. It's, it's, it's you present it and you present it in the best way, the most palatable way that you possibly can to as many vectors as you can. And then you pray for rain and you track it. And if it starts tracking poorly, then you got a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's funny. You know, I, I, I did the Muse Expo. Uh, about four years ago, I, I was moderating a panel, and Michael Rapino was on the panel, and he said a very interesting thing. He said, "You know, we looked at the at a problem that we had as 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 a company." He said, "You know, we put on four hundred and thirty four shows a day somewhere on this planet," and he said, "And the biggest problem we faced last year." This is like two thousand, you know, fourteen or thirteen, and he said, "Is the fact that you know." A huge percentage of our tickets, well, he said it's like 30%, went unsold. And he said when we put money and time and energy into researching why this happened, uh, he said it's because the number one reason why it happened is that people didn't know that their favorite actor, that the artist was playing in that territory. And he goes, and that's, that is a multi-pronged problem. It's not just poor promotion. It's the era we live in. It's the times. It's that, you know, getting people's attention is so hard he said, how many times, and he asked the audience this, he said, how many times has, like, you know, somebody said to you, hey, did you know that so-and-so was, you know, or that, sh-? and they're like, oh my God, you're kidding. I had no idea that, you know, fill in the blank was here two weeks ago, or that you missed your favorite artist, because, and he said, and it wasn't that long ago that, you know, you knew when your favorite act was coming, because it was so much easier to reach people, and now, you know, we have so many more tools, but it's still so hard to to get the word out, because we have so much more volume. Oh, Yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's great. It, it, and people have become immune to it too. I mean, it, like if you're just getting blasted by media all day, which we are, you, you're going to learn to to tune it out, focus yeah. and tune it out. Yep. And that's that's what most people do, and they're focused on what they need to do to get by. What's going to make them happy in that moment? Um, so yeah, that's tricky. What advice would you give a band or an artist starting out today on the best approach to booking themselves? Go to the the places where you're naturally inclined to go you know like if you're in los angeles and you're going to the echo again and again and again and you're playing music and and you're a local and you've got some friends like hit up liz garrow and lucana spaceland and be like hey you know i would love to open for the show that you have coming up and uh i'm willing to do it for a very low fee for the chance to be exposed to fans and you know You'll, you'll make friends that way because they're looking for local openers too. I mean, sometimes when, I, when I'm in a city, like, I mean, even like Salt Lake, like Salt Lake's a major metropolitan area, but for certain genres of music, it is extremely difficult to find strong local openers that are tapped into a very specific crowd of music. So the promoters need you too. And as long as you are never afraid to ask, then you'll be okay. I think that's the the biggest piece of advice. Don't yeah. be afraid to ask. Yeah, because all because they can say is no. <laughs> right. You got a 50-50 yeah. shot. And as long as you're not a dick about the way you're asking. Right. You know, if you're kind of like, hey, what do you think? <laughs> or, or in this new era where nobody responds to you, whether you send seven emails or not, and you get your answer either way. Yeah, exactly. I'll also, yeah, learn to take a no. Exactly. Um, yeah. And just, and just roll on, man, because, you know, the, the, you're not – like what you might imagine them to be thinking about you is probably not true. You know, nine times out of 10, they didn't even see, see your email because right. they thought you were spamming them to sell them insurance. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, you absolutely. Know, just take the ego out of it and relax. And, you know, it's just supposed to be a fun industry. Pete, let me ask you a sort of a future prognostication question. How do you see the live music sector evolving in the next three to five years? What, what do we have to look forward to? Well, like, I, like I've like uh, i alluded to earlier, I think that the uh, marriage of immersive theater with music is something that's happening uh, all everywhere, um, you know, with projects like Elro and Kind Heaven and 
cloak and dagger. And um, I think that that's going to be a big thing in uh, developing those niche genres of music. Um, there are already a lot of Burning Man derivative festivals, but that's also going to continue to develop um, all around the world. Um, and then I think you're going to see uh, an ex- an explosion in pop and hip hop and uh and country music like you already have seen i think that's going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger because that's the that's the new mainstream interesting okay what are the greatest challenges you face as an agent today uh, uh, okay so i've got a very unique challenge because i don't work at a, at a big agency i have my own office and so the the challenge that i'm facing right now is how to scale effectively and in time with what i need um, and what i can afford um because, you know, like, uh, I, have a, I have a small outfit. Like, I've got a general manager, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I am hiring two agents in, in the next month. And I'm hiring another assistant. And, you know, um, from the perspective of somebody who's always been employed by somebody else, uh, the responsibility in determining when you're going to hire an agent and for what purpose and who's going to be working for you um, is something that I, I really honor now more than ever because I don't think I gave it proper credit when I was an employee. <laughs> I mean, these are really difficult decisions, and um, you know, you got to find uh, the right people to work with you and uh, and ones that are going to develop your business. So for me, it's scalability. I think that that's something that's a challenge for everybody in the industry, whether you're a touring artist or a DJ or a club owner or whatever. It's like, what's next? How do you make this bigger? How do you make this better? How do you continue to refine this process um, so that it, it eventually you're making more and more money? Because I do think it is your moral obligation as somebody who works in music to make money. Are, are there any books or films or anything that you can recommend to our audience who are interested in pursuing a career in being an agent? Are there any that you've come across over the years that have been really inspirational or helpful to you? Have you seen uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I have, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, you really saw it. Movie. Yeah, okay. Did, did you find that inspirational as an agent to uh, see that? Or? I, I actually did um, for a variety of reasons, but one of which is the punk rock mentality that Quentin Tarantino takes into uh, the projects that he takes on. Um, I really admire that. I, I, I think that uh, political correctness is something that's destroying the country and uh, tearing people apart. And I think that we can all sort of laugh at that sometimes. And um, so I, I like that aspect of it because also it translates to the countercultures I'm supporting. Many of the artists that play our events at various times have been criticized you know, uh, for, for you know, worshipping the devil, which is you know, BS, or like <laughs> creating anarchy instigating anarchy but you know the thing is is that that sort of punk rock mentality is exactly why i love music and that's what drew me in in the first place was that adrenaline rush and that that rebellious feeling and so i don't want that to go away i don't i i'm scared of the music that i see that's popular today that's homogenizing everything and making it all make it all g-rated like i'm not into that like I, I want, I want to be thrilled. I want to be scared. I want to be excited. I want to be turned on. You know, I want all of that. Yeah, you want the authenticity of it. Yeah. So I, I, I do feel that what Quentin Tarantino just put out is an inspirational work. Um, but you know, I, I read a lot of um, books by musicians or authors. You know, conversations, the Kurt Vonnegut kind of stuff. Um, you know, Jim Morrison's poetry, you know, I really like stuff like that, where you're getting into what was happening in that culture at that time. Like, you don't really see any Jim Morrison's anymore, like guys that are that far out. <laughs> yeah. well, and that are connecting to a big mainstream audience. I mean, yes, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. I mean, the story of Graham Parsons would be ludicrous today. You can't, you know, his body being abducted from the tarmac at LAX, driven out to Joshua Tree and burned by his friends. <laughs> well, the consciousness around that. Yeah. Uh, the consciousness around that and yeah. why they did that. Right. You know, that potentially Graham Parsons actually didn't have a good relationship with his parents and turned away from the church and didn't want to be buried, you know, in a church in New Orleans. But that kind of that kind of rebellious streak to do something like that, I mean, that's what I fear is eroding. And especially in like the day of Trump. You know, where everyone seems scared to fight this guy. Like, what, what's that about? Like, you know, we're, we're all living, breathing people. And we all have, 
desires and passions and you should fight for that stuff and you should speak your mind and i feel like right now today people are being rewarded to sit down shut the fuck up and do as they're told yeah and it's a shame in music that that you know that 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 was a spirit that you know the 60s and and early 70s when music led the culture that you know artists did have it was that you know anti you know anti-culture counterculture movement where you know they weren't for the man so many people today as you just said are afraid to speak their mind and i'm talking artists specifically in music they're afraid of alienating the audience or they're afraid of alienating you know a sponsor or they're afraid of offending someone it's you know it's it's like uh, and and as a result you become this sort of generic you know whitewashed kind of homogenized version of themselves exactly a homogenized version of themselves absolutely and it's uh yeah, I, I totally see that, and it's we we've seen that for a long, long time. That uh, that same kind of consciousness, I, I I've seen that coming for a long time. Oh, also part of it is this online bullying thing, like where somebody could do something controversial, and they're they're guilty immediately by the crowds, right? You know? Right. Whether or not it's true or not, or maybe if it's something stupid. Like honestly, I feel bad for Ozzy Zanzari. <laughs> I feel really bad for that guy. Yeah. You Honestly, cannot, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would blowback stand by is that. just, yeah, is intense. Yeah, but, but I would stand by that comment. Like, I, I, I would publicly state that I feel bad for what happened to him yeah. and that he was victimized in a really brutal way by the public. Yeah. For something that was fairly, was, I mean, it obviously wasn't a, an ideal situation, but in the, in the scheme of what could happen, fairly innocuous. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and it is dividing, you know, it's very divisive. Uh, it's like you have to be either, you know, get in step and in line with this extreme or otherwise you're viewed as, you know, the opposite. Uh, as the opposite. And, and like you just pointed out, the blowback is intense because everybody can have an opinion and everybody can have a platform to articulate that opinion loud and clear. You know, so uh, what advice would you uh, offer to those looking to have a career as an artist in today's business? Focus on creating incredible music and um, an experience and a presentation and an aesthetic, you know, and just continue to focus on that and never feel like it's perfect. Like keep keep editing, keep adjusting. Pete, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. This was a really, really interesting conversation about, you know, on so many levels about a lot of things. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Yeah, thanks so much. No, I appreciate you guys being uh, um, patient with me because, you know, <laughs> these, cra- you know, obviously music industry is crazy and you never know what's going to be happening. You're running around just like with the chicken head cut off. So I appreciate your patience. No, no problem at all. Thank you for, thank you for doing it. Really fascinating interview. Yeah, I I really enjoyed this one. You you know what I loved about it, Eric, is that, you know, we've talked to agents before. Right. And one of the things that we got, uh, among many others, from Pete that I really loved is that he was giving us the perspective of a professional agent. Right. But of a world that's up and coming, that's, you know, niche that's really developing unique and compelling ways to garner an audience that's viable. We're not talking 20 people in a club in Silver Lake. We're talking really viable, you know. Audiences' tastes are changing and they're expecting more. And I think what he's doing and what he's involved with, they're providing that. Absolutely. I mean, he mentioned things like, you know, Burger Records uh, Festival versus Versus Coachella. Coachella. Exactly. Much more experimental. Right. Um, Much more, you know, for real music lovers as opposed to people that just want to go and be seen and, and, you know, right. And it's all about the the community exactly Um, and and i thought what was interesting is in that question was you know what are audiences willing to pay for an experiential experience um and and something that feeling organic and and creating a visceral experience where you come out of that saying wow i really enjoyed that and want more and you're seeing that you're seeing that much much more and and, you know i also thought that it, it it went along with his um his own sensibilities when he talked about, you know, what's his criteria for taking talent on. Right. He has to love it, love it. number one. But on a deeper level, you know, what, what? of course, we all have to love stuff. But right. what is it that he has to love? Well, he has to see the vision. Right. He wants to work with visionaries. He wants to work with visionaries in music who, you know, really understand and are doing something. And he wants to be able to help monetize that. Right. And create a business model, which I think is really great and fascinating to see that he can take something that's a real unique kind 
a niche thing and build a business around that. And you have to have a, a connection to community. I believe, you know, in, in relation to what you said about building a business around it, he mentioned Desert Days. Right. You know, which is something, it's a huge festival in the desert. It's 10,000 people per day. Right. Um, you know, and it's a tribute to like, you know, desert rock and that entire culture right. that supports that. So that that was also interesting. And, you know, along the lines of the people who... What I found really interesting was when we asked him, I think it was you that asked him about people who have developed bases right? Uh, who aren't necessarily famous. That is something that a lot of people, even in the music business, Eric, don't necessarily get. Right. That there are lots, I mean, dozens and hundreds of artists who are very, very viable, making incredible livings that no one has ever heard of. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about you know, how artists should be precious about the music that they are releasing and uh, the whole idea that it's a, it's a collective, you know, it's kind of like the word of mouth when you're initially starting that you're growing this and, you know, one person leads to three and three leads to five. And uh, the interesting thing that I thought he said, which is obviously what we've been harping on on the show episode after episode is that the content has to resonate. He said that above all yes. else, meaning the yes. music, and then you build around that. So if the music is not resonating with any Anybody, I hate to tell everybody out there, it's just not going to happen. So you've got to get the music together. That's right. And he, he, he talked about that also from a live perspective, that the way a lot of these communities got built, and they are communities, was organically. Right. You did one performance, and then you got invited exactly. to another. Exactly. And then you did and that's how it grows. Else. Right. And it goes, it doesn't grow in 20 minutes. Right. It, you know, and this is where you, know, you and I have always been talking about uh, on this show that this life is about a commitment to a way of life. Right. It's not if we do X, Y, Z, this will happen in one year. And if right. it doesn't happen, well, I'll go drive a truck. Uh, you know, it's a build. You got to be committed to it as a way of life in right. order for it to happen. You know, any of these people, I mean, look at Coachella. Co Coachella was an idea that lost money in the first, what, seven, seven years, years yeah. you know, before it actually became profitable what it is today yeah. exactly but you know imagine if they had just given up on it in the first you know two or three years right it would have been you know a, a, a memory of the past much like the us festival was exactly one time, one time. right yeah. um yeah and and i thought the other uh you know final point was you know how will the live music scene evolve in the next three to five years now obviously the time of this interview we're talking about covid times we're in now so it's going to be really interesting to see how it evolves from this point but I think one of the things that he talked about was the marriage with immersive theater. Yes. And about how that is going to continue to grow. And you're seeing that everywhere now. Absolutely. You're seeing, you're seeing people who want a different their kind of Their sensibilities are changing. Yes. And so are their demands and the criteria around that in terms of what works musically and how music is presented. It's not necessarily just the music, but like you're saying, the presentation of that. And he mentioned things like, you know, Kind Heaven, Cloak and Dagger. Right. Um, you know, and bringing a strong sense of community with something like that. And that I don't think uh, is something that's going to go away ever. Hey, insiders, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U -U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra, and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Caboteglou, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast.